Hey, good morning, church family. I hope you are doing well. It's so good to see you. So good to gather together with all of you. I love that we can gather together because there are several things that happen for me. I don't know about you, but for me, one thing is that as we sing of God's goodness, as we sing of who Jesus is, as we were just singing, how wonderful, how powerful, how beautiful is the name of Jesus, all of the problems that I have walked through this week, all the heaviness that I may have carried into this place, I start to see how big my God is in comparison to how small my problems are. Amen? And so as I'm reminded of this big God, I'm not just reminded that he is with me, but when I sing with all of you, it also reminds me that I'm not alone, right? Whatever I'm facing, whatever I'm going through, I am not alone. I am doing it with my church family, and the enemy would try to convince you that as you go through difficulty, as you walk through pain and tribulation, the enemy would try to convince you that you are alone in that. But when you come in this place, I hope that you would look around and know there are people who are ready to link arms with you, to encourage you, to pray for you, and to inspire you to do all that God is calling you to do. Amen? And so if you're kind of new at New Life Bible Church, if you've gone here forever, whatever it is, even if you feel like you don't know a lot of people, I encourage you, if you reach out, You make the steps that I promise this is a group of people who are ready to welcome you, to love on you, to encourage you to live for the Lord. All of that was just going through my mind as I was sitting there worshiping with all of you this morning. So today, now we've sung our declarations of God's goodness. We've been together as a church family in fellowship together, but now also we're going to hear from the Lord. I pray that the Lord would speak to us today through his word, and we're going to dive into Isaiah chapters 8 and 9. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up. We're going to be jumping around in both of those chapters quite a bit. I'm going to try my best not to be confused and not to confuse you. That is my goal today. But we are wrapping up this series called Hope is Alive. And this has been just a great series for myself in hearing the stories of how God is moving in people's lives. I remember just a few weeks ago, uh, a friend came up to me after the service, and he told me how he had been walking through some addiction in his life. And his life was just kind of on a path that was heading in the wrong direction. And as God had been speaking to him, as God had been dealing with him, his hope was renewed. And he came up and he said, you know what, Pastor, I'm going to get my life back on the right track. I, and I know that it is possible. I know that God is able to move and that God is able to help me live the life that he desires for me. And he was just excited, filled with hope to do what God had called him to do. Even this past week, as storms came through our city, as people were facing that, I saw one of the members of our church talking about as the storms were coming and it's loud and it's scary and there's anxiety and uncertainty about the future. She was saying how she was just reminded of those words. Hey, there's hope in God. Doesn't matter what happens, doesn't matter what I face, doesn't matter what I walk through, my hope is rising. And that's my prayer for all of you. That's been the goal in this series, that you would know no matter what you walk through, you have a hope in Jesus Christ and your hope is firm, your hope is secure, your hope is unchanging. Amen? And so we begin on Easter Sunday because our hope is alive as Jesus is alive. When Jesus came out of the grave, impossible went out the window. He can do all things, and he is able to bring light even in the darkest situations of your life. And I recognize that maybe some of you have walked in this place, and and everything looks fine on the outside, but you might be sitting there right now thinking, man, if these people knew what I'm going through, if these people knew what was really going on in my life, if these people knew what... Our marriage was really going through. If these people knew what I'd been thinking about all week, if these people knew how I'd been spending my money all week, if these people knew what I'd been looking at all week, if these people knew where I had been, if these people knew what I'd been putting in my body, if these people knew what was really going on, there's no way any of them would want to have anything to do with me. And and the truth of the matter is, like I said, this is a church family that is filled with no one who is perfect. Is anybody here perfect today? No, good, okay. (laughs) Nobody here is perfect, and so we welcome you in to stand with you and to walk with the Lord together, but also know this, also know this, no situation is so dark that God's light cannot shine and bring new and living hope into your situation. There is no path that you might be on that is so far gone that God is not able to do something incredible today if you will surrender and trust in him and lean into him. That is the hope that we have. That's the hope that we're talking about. So without further ado, let's jump into Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17. 
Isaiah is a prophet in Jerusalem at a time when the people of Israel had really turned away from God. They've turned away from God. And I want you to look at these words that he writes. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And I will what? I will hope in him. I will hope in him. These are powerful words when you recognize that the people of Judah in this passage, they are under extreme like pressure. They're under the threat of enemy nations. There is darkness. Things are not good. The world around them, their circumstances are bad. And in the midst of that, we read this, I will hope, I will hope in him. And that's the mark of those who would follow God. That's the mark of the people who would follow Jesus. Judah is a picture of all humanity, and this is what should be true of us. That even in the darkest circumstances, even in the most painful situations, we should be marked as a people that are not known by our fear, our worry, our anxiety of the uncertainty that lies ahead of us. We should be known as a people who rise up in hope even in the midst of the darkest situations. And maybe you're here today and you don't feel that way, right? Like maybe you're here and you're thinking like, that is not me. Like I don't know what he's talking about, but that is not how I look at the world. So I want to talk today about three of the places where we're going to put our hope, three ways this is possible as Isaiah lays it out for us. Number one, if you're taking notes, is this. Our hope is in God's zeal. Our hope is in God's zeal. This whole passage we're studying today, it ends with this verse in Isaiah 9, verse 7. It ends with this statement, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Like I said, Judah here is a picture for all humanity. And Judah is walking through incredible darkness. Let's look at at, at what is going on in the world where it says, the zeal of the Lord will do this. Isaiah 8. Verses 21 to 22, talking about the people. And you read this and tell me if you think it sounds like the world we live in today. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God. And turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be thrust into thick darkness. Well, what's happening here? The people of Israel, they are going through darkness. They're facing the gloom of anguish. They're facing all these problems and distress. And they're essentially looking up at God. They're like shaking their fists and they're saying, God, this is your fault. Like, God, you have done this. Because they look at the world and what do they see? What do we read there? Darkness, distress, anguish. God, you've done this. Now, the great irony of that portion, remember what I said earlier, like the people have actually turned away from God. So they have said, God, we don't want your will. We don't want your purpose. We don't want your way. We don't want your word. We're going to turn away from you. But then when they experience the darkness and the gloom that comes with that, they're saying, God, this is your fault. They're shaking their fists at God, but they have forgotten something so important about God. If you remember in the creation passages, God has created all things, and what does he say? God stands back, and he's like, not bad, right? Not bad. That's not what he says. What does God say? He says, it's very good. God has made all things very good. God made this earth very good for us to live in human flourishing, for us to experience the beauty of creation, for us to live in worship. God has made all things in perfect joy, perfect peace, perfect harmony. That's how God made the world. But the humankind has turned away from him, rejected him, said, God, I don't want to do it your way. I think I can do it better myself. I'm going to do things my way. And then sin, darkness, anguish, hopelessness exploded onto the scene. God's heart is grieved by the darkness that we see in the world today. Every heavy weight that you may have walked into this place with everything that causes anxiety or fear to rise up within you, it is not sourced by God. His heart is grieved by it. If you remember Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus is standing there. His friend has passed on. The people around are in anguish. They're weeping because they've lost their friend Lazarus. And Jesus is there knowing 
that he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, right? Like, how would you like to have that superpower? Just kind of wake up one morning, I think I'm going to go ruin a funeral today, right? I'm just going to walk in and make the guy get out of the casket. Like, how cool would that be? So Jesus is standing there, knowing that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but we read that Jesus wept. Jesus was greatly distressed, and in the original language, it means that he was indignant. He was angry while he stood there and saw the darkness of death, the distress that sin had brought into the world. God's heart is grieved by it. He's moved by grief. But, but even in the midst of all that darkness and pain and distress and anguish, God does not leave us on our own. God doesn't just kick us to the curb. God doesn't just give up on us. It says that he will even shine his light into that darkness. That is how good, how gracious, how compassionate, and how kind he is. He doesn't give up on us. Into that, he shines his light. So look at the next verse as we get to Isaiah chapter 9. We've learned about the distress, the darkness, the anguish, the gloom that fills the world. But the next word, Isaiah 9 verse 1, is what? It is, but, nevertheless, but, there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Let me tell you what chapter uh, verse 1 there is talking about. The people of Judah are under the threat of attack from the Assyrians. These guys are up north. Zebulun and Naphtali, those are the northernmost tribes there of Israel. And essentially it's saying those who are the most vulnerable, those who are in the most danger, those people who are the most hopeless, they're the very ones that God is going to rescue. They're the very ones that God is going to do something miraculous and incredible like they could not believe. It's those who feel like their hope is gone, those who feel like their situation is too bad, those who feel like things are as bad as they can get. They're the ones on whom God shines his light. That's what he does. God is in the business of bringing hope to the most hopeless situations. Amen? Verse 2 then says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, that word there literally means the darkness of death. Again, as bad as it can get, they have seen a great light, and on them has light shone. My friends, I'm telling you, if you are here today and you feel like some part of your life is as bad as it can get, Oh, I'm so glad you're here today because I think God wants you to hear this reminder that he specializes in shining light into situations that are as bad as they can get. And you might be sitting here thinking, you know what, man, my marriage is as bad as it can get. God is able to bring hope to the most hopeless situations. You may be sitting here thinking, my health, my physical health, it is as bad as it can get. Every day, I don't feel like I can get out of bed. My body is just not working like I feel like it's supposed to. God specializes in bringing miraculous light into the darkness, most hopeless situations. Amen? You may be sitting here thinking, my financial situation my career, my education. I don't know what it is, but if there's a part of your life where you feel like things are as bad as they can get, I want to remind you that God specializes in bringing hope to the most hopeless situations. Look what he does. Verse three, you have multiplied the nation. Now, I want you to remember what we just talked about. The world is filled with darkness, distress, the anguish of gloom, deep darkness, the darkness of death. And this is how quickly and how magnificently and miraculously God changes things around. Verse 3, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. How incredible is that? Where there was despair, darkness, the gloom of anguish, now there is joy. That's what God does. God will replace despair with joy. You have multiplied the nation. You have, uh, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. In the ancient world, in an agricultural society, harvest season 
I mean, it would be just one huge party. And God is saying, not only will I shine light in the darkness, not only will I bring joy where you had despair, you are going to feel like the people at harvest season. It is going to be filled with excitement, exuberant joy. God changes things around. They are glad when they divide the spoil. Where there was once defeat, God will bring victory. That is what he does. Verse 4, for the yoke of his burden... And the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. That's talking about Gideon, who was a a general who faced insurmountable odds, but led God's people to victory in the face of insurmountable odds. And that verse is saying more specifically, God replaces the yoke, bondage, tyranny, and burden. God replaces it with freedom. My friend, maybe you walked into this place today, and there are some chains. Like, we can't see them. Maybe nobody knows about them, but, but, but there are some chains of bondage on your life. You're facing an addiction. You're facing something that just derails your life, and you feel like you are a prisoner. You are a prisoner to that bondage. And what's incredible is God not only shines his light into the darkness, God not only is able to bring hope where there was once hopelessness, he is able by the power of his spirit at work in us, he is able to free us from the chains of bondage. He is able to bring freedom. He is able to bring new life where you feel like you just cannot go And finally, verse 5, every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. God replaces bloodshed with peace. Now, everything that I've read, is anybody a candidate for that kind of world? where he would replace bloodshed with peace, where he would replace despair for victory, where he would replace sadness for joy, where he would replace freedom where there is, where there is tyranny and oppression and bondage. That's what he does. But here's the good news, because I can hear all that, and I can just be like, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. But the good news of point number one is this. His zeal will accomplish this. His zeal will accomplish this. What's that mean? That means it doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on on if you can just muster up enough strength and energy. It doesn't depend on if you can just be devoted enough. It doesn't just mean you have to be good enough. It is his zeal. He is passionate about bringing the world into the order that he intended for it to be. He is passionate about making this happen. It is his zeal that will accomplish this. Look at Isaiah 42, verse 13. Look at this. I love this verse. The Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war. He stirs up his zeal. He stirs up his zeal. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. I mean, God, I don't know what you've got a picture there for that to make sense to you. Maybe for you, it's, it's William Wallace with his face painted blue, riding on his horse in his skirt, and he's like, they can take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. I don't know if that's what does it. I don't know if it's Maximus on his horse, also in a skirt, ironic. I don't know why that happens, but anyway, Maximus before his soldiers, riling them up. I don't know if it's your favorite quarterback. I don't know if it's your favorite point guard, whatever it is. God is like a soldier. God is like a warrior, and he is riling himself up, stirring up his zeal in order to make this happen. He is going to bring goodness into the world. He is going to change those places that are filled with darkness and let his light flood those places. Whatever part of your life is hopeless, God is able to bring hope there. Because he's not just at work in the world. He works this way in your life as well. And we've got to know that. We've got to know that. I think this is the most important message in this series. Might not be the best, but I think it's the most important. Because over the past 12 months, for many of you, myself included, I bet there were some days where you just felt like, man, I can't can't go on. Like I just cannot keep trying to muster the energy 
to keep going. I can't keep trying to muster enough wisdom or knowledge to make the right decisions and move forward. Maybe some of you grew apathetic. Like there were days for me where I was just filled with apathy. I was just like, I don't care anymore. Right? Like I'm trying and I'm doing the right thing, but it seems like I get 10 steps ahead and then something happens in the world and I got to take 20 steps back. And it's always 10 steps ahead, 20 steps back. Anybody there? You feel apathetic. You feel filled with despair, like you cannot go on. And this passage is revealing to us that God, even when you're tired, he's not tired. Even when you're growing weary, he is not weary. Even when you're ready to give up, he is not going to give up. His zeal will accomplish this. He's keeping on moving his kingdom forward, and it doesn't matter how worn out we get. He's still at work. His zeal will accomplish this. He's working in the world. He's working in your life, too. Philippians 1, verse 6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God has begun a work in you. And even on those days where you feel like you don't have what it takes, even on those days where you feel like you can't go on, even on those days where you feel like you don't measure up, you don't have the strength, the energy to make it happen, God's zeal will accomplish it. He's passionately, passionately looking to make this happen in the world and in your life. I remember, don't judge me for this analogy, but if you remember when Frodo and Sam are on Mount Doom, and it's the end of the Lord of the Rings, right? And and Frodo's just got to go a little bit further. You remember this? And he's just like, I can't go on. Like, I cannot do what I'm supposed to do. I cannot complete my task or my purpose. I can't do it. You remember what Sam does? Who remembers? What does he do? He's like, Mr. Frodo, I can't carry the ring for you, but I can carry you, right? And he picks him up, and he carries him on to the end to accomplish his purpose. And really, I know it's silly, but work with me here. Really, this is what God does. Like, he's called you to a purpose. He wants to do this in your life. He wants to see those good things come to completion in your life. And when you get to the end of your rope, when you get to that place where you feel like, I cannot go on, I cannot do this, God is saying, I will carry you the rest of the way, right? My zeal will accomplish it. Amen? Amen. I don't know who that's for. I spent a lot more time on that than I wanted to, but I really feel like there's somebody in the room and like you needed to hear that this morning. I really feel that there's someone here in this room and you are just feeling like, I don't know that I can go on. I know what I need to do. I understand the idea of hope, but I don't have it in me to cross that line. I don't have it in me to finish the race. I just don't have it in me. And you needed to be reminded today that God, God is at work and his zeal will accomplish it. All right? We're not going to get to the end of the message. That's okay. I'm just going to stop on time. The second point is this. The second point is this. God's zeal, (laughs) yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Come back next week, I don't know. God's zeal will accomplish this. God's zeal will accomplish, but the second thing is this. Our hope is in God's son. Our hope is in God's zeal, absolutely, but our hope is in God's son. This is why my hope is unfading. This is why my hope doesn't change no matter what I go through in this life or in this world. This is why my hope doesn't dissipate no matter how dark things get or how difficult things get or how painful my situation gets because my hope is in God's son. That light that came into the world is a person, right? This is not meant to sound cliche, but this anchors my life. Hope has a name. It is not just some kind of idea. It is not just something ethereal out there that I can't touch. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus, and that is the reason for my hope. So Isaiah 9 verse 6 says this, for to us, this is our favorite Christmas verse, for to us, a child is born, talking about the humanity of Christ. He is fully man. He is able to sympathize with your weakness, and now he sits at the right hand of God, making intercession for you on your behalf, fully man. Like Tom said earlier, he is personal. He comes close. He is acquainted with your sufferings and the things that you are dealing with, the darkness you are walking through. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And, and that's the language of kingship, 
right? He is king. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He is fully man, but he is fully God, filled with power and omnipotence and able to do all things. A son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called. This is who he is. This is the one who my hope is in. He is the wonderful counselor. He is what we saying that earlier. His name is wonderful. He is worthy. He is wise. He gives good counsel. He guides my life. He is the Lord of my life. He's the mighty God. He has the power to overcome anything that I come against. He has the power to overcome any obstacle that you face. That's what you have hope in the midst of every painful thing that you walk through because he's the mighty God who is filled with power. He is the everlasting father. This is not a a, a Trinitarian statement. This is a statement about him as king. In the ancient world, a king was seen like a father figure whose job it was to protect his children. Jesus, as my everlasting father, he is my benevolent protector. He is the one I know will keep me safe no matter what I go through. I see this over and over in my children. Like my, my children might be uncertain about something. They might be a little fearful about something. They might be a little worried about something. I think Simi put this post up a couple weeks ago where, where it was my, my daughter Mariah when she was a baby. I mean, she was less than a year old. She was just this tiny like turkey butterball. I was holding her like this, like a football. And we went to a birthday party and, and they had these Clydesdales there. If you know the Express Clydesdales in Yukon, they had these Clydesdales. Those horses are like as big as this room, right? It's ridiculous. So she's all excited to go to this birthday party with her friends. And she's like, Dad, I want to see the horses. Well, she probably wasn't talking, right? Oh, okay. She's thinking this and I'm reading her mind, right? I'm reading her mind. Her eyes are telling me, Dad, I'm excited to see the horses. And so we get there and she sees the sheer size of these monsters and she's like, nope. Not going to do it. Like, no. I mean, these things are huge. And Simi's got this picture of me holding Mariah, and she's just petting this horse like, come here, little horsey. Everything's going to be okay. Why? Because my daddy's got me. Right? As long as my daddy is holding me, I'm not afraid of anything. He's not going to let anything happen to me. Nothing's going to touch me. Nothing's going to harm me. He's going to take care of me. My friend, that is who Jesus is. Your everlasting father. And if you will just bundle up into his arms, he will protect you from danger. That doesn't mean your life is going to be easy. That doesn't mean that you're not going to go through some difficulties. I'm not saying you're going to walk out of here and never have any problems. I'm saying no matter what you face, you are in the hands of your benevolent protector, your king, your everlasting father, and he won't let it harm you. He won't. You might feel the pain. You might go through difficulty, but you know this, that he's not going to let it harm you, that your hope is ultimately in him. He is taking you somewhere. The zeal of the father will accomplish it, but you hope in the son. Put your hope in him. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John chapter eight, verse 12. He is the light, but he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's our everlasting father. He is the light of the world, but you must follow him. And that's where so many of us fall short. Oh, I love Jesus. My everlasting. Yes, he's going to protect me. He's got me. I love it. Tears. It's so beautiful. But then when I say you've got to follow him, that's where some of us are like, oh, I don't know about all that. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Where is he going to take me? Like, what's he going to tell me to do? <laughs> We've got to follow him. That word follow in the original language, of akulatheo, it, it means like a soldier following their general into battle. We're going to follow the Lord of our life where he leads us. Yeah. If he is our wonderful counselor, do we have to doubt where he's leading us to go? Right? Jesus knows what you need to know. Jesus has the information you need for life and godliness. It is laid out in his word, and if you will follow him, he will lead you into light, out of darkness and into the light. Amen? Amen. Finally, I want to end with this. Our hope is in God's zeal. Our hope is in God's son. Our hope is in God's kingdom. If you look at Isaiah 9, verse 7, 
the increase of his government, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. This is the blessed hope we cling to. I didn't have time to dive into that passage as much as I would love to, so I encourage you to go home, read it, study it, get it into your soul. But our hope is in God's zeal. His plan, his purpose will not be thwarted. It will not fail. God is moving things forward. Our hope is in God's son. Because here's the thing, Jesus, the very light of the world, he knew sin was the problem. Sin is what thrust our world into darkness and despair and pain. So Jesus came to deal with the problem of sin. And the light of the world was thrust into darkness so that you and I could walk in light forever if we will trust in him. The light of the world was snuffed out on the cross so that you and I could be pulled up out of the muck and the mire and our feet could be set on a solid rock so that you and I could be pulled out of the darkness and we could walk in the light all the days of our life. That's who he is. And when he returns, that's our hope. That's our blessed hope. That's our ultimate hope. That he is coming back. That he will return. And he will not return as a humble baby lying in a manger. He will return as a conquering king. As a warrior who will come and, foot every, who will come and put every enemy of God under his foot. Amen? And so we hope in his return. That is our blessed hope. That is our eternal hope. And when he returns... He will lift up everything that is fallen. He will mend everything that is broken. He will repair and shine light, unending and eternal light into all the dark places of the world. Amen? I'm going to end with Revelation 21, verses 3 to 5. I heard a loud voice from the throne. This is when our king returns. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. We've talked about the hope that we have in Jesus. Over the past month, we've been talking about this idea of hope. And I know we live in a broken world. I know we live in a dark world. I know that you're going to go to work tomorrow. You're going to go to school tomorrow, students. I know that that you're going to be with your kids tomorrow, managing your home, trying to move your family forward, and you're going to face darkness. You're going to face despair. Some of you might wake up in the morning tomorrow, and you might be like, I don't want to get out of bed. I do not have it in me to move on. And I want you to remember. I want you to remember. That the God of the universe, the powerful, magnificent, mighty God who we sang to, God is moving his purpose forward. God is at work even when it feels in your life like he's not, even when you cannot see it, even when it seems like he has hidden his face from Jacob, we will hope in God. We will wait in him. And our hope should rise up within us because our hope is not in our circumstances Our hope is in God's zeal, our hope is in God's son, and our hope is in the kingdom of God that is coming. And here is the beauty of grace. Here's the beauty of God's love for us. It is not up to you to somehow muster up all this stuff and make it happen on your own strength and diligence and devotion. You shouldn't walk out of this place feeling like that Burden is on your shoulders. Simply, God asks that you would humbly come to him the way Jesus humbly came to this world. God simply asks that you would come and throw yourself on the mercy of Christ and say, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. 
Jesus, I have messed up. I've tried to live life on my own. I've turned away from you, and I've walked in darkness and the gloom of anguish and despair. Jesus, I throw myself on your mercy. And in his goodness, in his kindness, and his grace, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace will scoop you up in his arms and make you new. You will be adopted into the family of God as his child held in the arms of your father for the rest of your days. That's why we have hope. That's why we have hope. And so I don't want you to walk out of this place with some psychological principle or eight steps to a better life. That's not what today is about. Today is about you walking out of this place with your heart filled with worship for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who gave himself for you who thrust himself into darkness so you could walk in light, so that you could have eternal and living hope for all your days. Amen? Amen. Father God, we come.